What's up? It's Jared Cagle. This is a podcast called Burning Questions because we are answering your burning questions. All right. Third episode. Very special guest, Chris Gibbs. How are we doing? <laughs> I'm doing good, man. You doing good? I am. Fashion icon? You can't say that. Come on. No. throw. Uh, we should make a hashtag for you. Like, <sighs> no. Flashback Fashion no. Friday. No, no, you know, no, no, like. No. You're wearing a primetime Atlanta. I mean, Deion Sanders, for those that don't know who primetime is. I am. I it's got a lucky. Big deal. I got lucky. Where'd you find it? Come on, there's a story. Plato's Closet. No. Yes. I'm Here? telling you. Yes. You just got to look. Some people just don't know what they have. And it's gone. And You're you joking up. me. I promise. In Buford. I promise. Buford, Georgia. Mm -hmm. I was going to the mall one day, stopped by Plato's. Saw it on the rack. I didn't even know it was a Dion jersey. I just saw the Braves. You got it before you saw who it was. Oh, yeah. Stop. Went over the counter, <laughs> turned it around, and I was like, wait a minute. And I, I called my dad. I was like, who? I didn't even realize it. I thought it was like some no-name or like somebody to put their name on the back of a jersey. And I called him, and he was like, are you serious? And I was like, yeah. He was like, it's 24. And I was like, I promise. Brought it home, and he <laughs> lost his mind. So he didn't wear 21 when he played baseball then? No. He just wore it for the 24. Time. I think 21 might have been taken. Gotcha. I think that might be the reason. Anyway, yeah. sorry, that's a side note, but that is, <laughs> that is awesome. Cool. You are a fashion icon. You started a business one time. Uh, I tried vintage to. clothes. I and, tried to. And it boomed. It, in, it in did Kennesaw, for a little Marietta, while. You know, let me, let me boost you a little <laughs> bit, baby. Okay. You brought a candle because that's a thing. The and, best uh, one, apparently. Yeah. What's the, what's the flavor of the fragrance today, I think it's Chris? mahogany teakwood. Yeah, mahogany teakwood. Mama Gibbs. Mama Gibbs. Yep. Gotta shout out. Her a shout out. Shout out to Mama. She watches. And Carla Gibbs. She loves them. I love it. I love it. I do love this scent, actually. Some of you know. Um, I love all scents. It's kind of a problem. <laughs> um, cool. So here we are. We got a question today. I'm going to pose it to you. It's been submitted to us. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm excited about this conversation because I think it's one that a lot of people want to know mm -hmm. about, but have a hard time asking about, especially when they're in the middle of it. And um, coming from your experience as well, I think this is going to be a good conversation. You're yeah. going to be able to really help us. So here's the question. If you're ready, uh, you know, it's there. It's deep. So we're going. We're going for it. You feel good, Dion? Yeah, okay. I do. All right, all right. So I'm here, ready for it. Here it is, submitted by a student. Everything is going wrong in my life, and I feel like God is a million miles away. I've tried everything, but nothing is working. I'm depressed. How do I experience God in the midst of depression? Hmm. Mm -hmm. The the. Th the choice of words with this mm -hmm. question, um, we talked about it a mm -hmm. little bit before, um, stood out to me. And, I mean, there's not much, in my opinion, that people outside of your immediate family, mm -hmm. whoever you talk to on a daily basis, they aren't going to be able to notice the differences in your behavior. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be able to notice when um, you start to feel this way, when you start to feel pain, when you start to feel uneasy about the things you're doing and you feel lost. Um, nobody else really noticed, at least in my experience, besides people who genuinely cared about me and mm -hmm. noticed how my mannerisms were when I was normal and noticed how they changed and noticed how things were just different. And when things start to go differently, in my opinion, if you don't have somebody that is there um, to pull you or at least try to, I know um, people are stubborn. They like to mm -hmm. stay in their own lane and do whatever they think is right. But I've been proven wrong so many times in the past three or four years and every time it's just like a humbling experience because you sit there and you hate it but you tell your mom you tell your dad you tell your mentor whoever it is like you were right mm -hmm. and you learn something because of those mistakes that might lead you down a really really dark path that you never really knew you could get into in the first place yeah um but it i like to use the same cliche um everybody uses with it's a domino effect once you make mm -hmm. one decision there are three or four things that are going to happen. There's going to be people that are affected. There's going to be collateral damage um, if you don't make the right decisions. And 
that's the biggest thing that really took a lot out of me. I think when I went through my depression and when I realized all my anxiety was how much collateral damage my decisions were actually causing Wow. because I didn't realize how many people loved me. I didn't mm -hmm. realize how many people cared about me. I didn't realize that people genuinely were there for me, even though, and you said it um, in the last one, I wrote it down. Um, isolation is destruction. Mm -hmm. And that's the biggest thing. When you're depressed, you just want to be by yourself. And when you do that, you draw away from everything that matters. And when you do that, there's really nothing that anybody can do unless you make the decision yourself that I'm going to change something. I don't like how this feels. And for me, it's kind of like you tell others to stand up for themselves. Like you have to stand up for yourself, mm -hmm. like against whatever you are battling. You have to say, I'm worth it. I'm here. And there's a point to everything. Like there's a reason you're where you are and there's a reason that you're going to get through it. And there's a reason that mm -hmm. he's going to get you through it one way or the other, yeah, whether you're hurting or not. It's good. Isolation is destruction. So, that's hard, right? Because when you're depressed and you're in depression, the last thing you want is to be around people. People, Yeah. So that's, do you feel like that's kind of the devil's way of, of ruining us? Yeah, like, you know, <laughs> for sure. That like that unconscious, like social anxiety that you get, like, you know, that you should be there, but you also don't want to be you're like okay like i'm i still got to make everybody think i'm mm. not feeling this way like it, i'm the only person that can see like for me nobody like i said besides the people who were there every single day talking to me like nobody knew nobody like even people that would probably consider me like a really really close friend in some ways like if they weren't someone that i went to every day they had no idea wow because it was so like it was like an embarrassment kind of, because I was like, you know, I've always been involved in like athletics. I've always done my best to step out of my comfort zone mm -hmm. and do things that I don't like. And when I did that, it at this point in my life, high school to college, it like backfired on me for the first time. It was like the first loss I'd ever taken like in my life, like everything had gone well until then. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't really know how to handle it the first time that I went through it. And it was dark, I mean, there were a lot of nights to where I didn't really get to the point to where I didn't know if I was going to make it, but I didn't really like, I'm a, I'm a big, big guy on trying to understand as much as I can about anything. Even mm -hmm. if I don't have knowledge of it, even if I don't have any reason to know about it, if it's important to the majority, if it's important to anything, um, I try to figure it out. So especially when it happens to me, I try to break it down. I try to figure out what I can do to get through it. And I exhausted myself doing that. I mean, I stayed up night after night um, just trying to figure out why why am I going through this? What did, going back, what did I do to get myself here? What did I what are the choices that I made that put me in this position and why can't I make different choices to get out of it? Why does it seem like I'm just chasing my tail? And it was because I was trying to find things, like fleshly things, mm. to grab onto. For a long time, it was a girl. For a long time, it was drugs. For a long time, it was the boys that I hung out with in college. It was anything that I could get my hands on that would distract me, get my mind off what's really wrong. And I still do it to this day. I still run to things that I shouldn't run to in times of need or in times of pain when I should really start to focus on, okay, why is this pain happening to me? What, if, what are my decisions causing and why am I doing these things that are causing me to feel this way mm -hmm. and when I start to look at that and I, I look at the decisions that I make I start to realize why some of the things end up happening the way they mm -hmm. do because at the time they may seem okay it isn't that bad or it isn't it isn't going to hurt me long term but then something happens something goes well for me or something turns and that decision ends up impacting me in a way that I didn't really think about wow so like when you put yourself in a situation, you got to figure out why you got there to figure out how to like get out of it first. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, you're going to make those same decisions yeah. again. Go back to the root. Yeah. Go back to the, yeah. If you go to the same things to get you out of it, it's, it's just going to be a reoccurring effect. Mm -hmm. At least that's my experience. Yeah. So you, so you've been there. This, you didn't submit this question to my knowledge, but sounds like you could have. <laughs> <laughs> so, I definitely could have. <laughs> so, uh, if you would like maybe walk us through a little more of your journey with this, you know, in terms of 
you're talking a lot about your decisions and how that affected your depression um, and how you've experienced the same thing that this person is experiencing. Was the depression there before, like early on in your life? Like when did that start? Maybe walk us through your journey a little bit if you're comfortable. De the depression aspect of it for me, I didn't even, I don't think, realize or diagnose whatever words you mm -hmm. want to use for a very long time. Um, my dad, when I was younger, um, was always, always with us or by himself. That was the man mm -hmm. that I saw. He took care of us. He worked 60, 70, 80 hours a week, came home, rested, went back to work came to our basketball games, came to our soccer games. Like it was just him and us. He didn't like, for some reason, the way he was back then, he just, we were his main focus in every aspect. And so I kind of saw a role model that took care of a very, very small circle of people. And so as I grew up, that's kind of what I magnetized towards. I had the same, I'd say five to six, like, boys from mm -hmm. sixth grade to my senior year. I didn't make new friends. Like I had acquaintances, as bad as it would sound, like people that I would talk to every day, but like genuine people who knew what was going on with me, about six of them for that entire period of time. And I liked it that way. I kept it that way. Um, but when you, and this is just me speaking on what I experienced, when I, did that and I isolated myself from pretty much everyone else when those people ended up turning on me like in any kind of way whether whether I thought it was um something stupid whether they thought it was something stupid just something that happened that didn't go my way it was always like we were a group so I had really no one besides mom and dad and sis to go to with it so mm -hmm. like when you're in high school you're like, well, I can't tell my parents this, or I can't talk to them about this. I'm not comfortable sure. enough. They don't understand. But, and that was my mindset the entire time I was in high school. So every time that something happened with them, with anyone else, with a girl, I just tucked it in. And um, my senior year came around, um, and I had played basketball my entire life. Um, yeah, you did. Balling. <laughs> I played my entire PG. life. Point and... guard with the ball, baby. Dropping downs. <laughs> 20 a game. 20 and 10. And Who's your favorite player? Chris Paul? All time or all time. right now? All time. Mm, a lot of people aren't going to like my answer, but my favorite player of all time is definitely Russell Westbrook. Stop. Um, That's right now, too. Oh, yeah. Easily. All right. Carry um, on. So you played ball. I did. <laughs> um, and... We had a situation that happened at my high school to where me and the coach didn't agree on some things, and it ended up taking what my life had been centered around and my saving grace pretty much. Like, that's what I went to any mm -hmm. anytime anything was wrong, go hoop. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of taken away from me my sophomore and my junior year, and I just, like, lost a love for the game just completely. Um, and when I did that, I had a lot of time to fill because before it was JV practice from mm -hmm. 630 to 745. You go to class, then you had varsity practice from 4 to 630, get home at 7, eat, do your homework, go to bed, do it over again. Mm -hmm. And so I had a lot of time to fill. And so I started hanging out with people that weren't involved in sports, that weren't involved in things that I was doing, um, and weren't involved with the same thing I was trying to do going forward with my future. So my senior year rolls around, and I made the decision to not play basketball, which was huge for my family because it was something that I had done for a very long time. Um, and f all the space that basketball had filled, all the time, all the weekends after school, now that was open. And so I filled that with people who weren't involved in sports and weren't involved in the same things that I needed to be involved in. Um, and the right things that I needed to be doing mm -hmm. were now not the things I was doing. And so my 18th birthday rolls around. Um, the Friday was the 10th, Saturday was the 11th, and Sunday was the 12th. And I was busy Friday night. Um, we had made uh, some plans with two girls when me and my friend did, um, but we were busy. Saturday was for my family. 
And so Sunday, I went to church. I uh, went to lunch, celebrated, and then I told my parents I was going to hang out with somebody. Lied to them and hung out with somebody else. Um, things led to certain actions that I really did not think were going to happen, certain things that I was not, I don't think in that time, really caring about. I think I was just kind of flying by the seat of my pants, as my dad likes to say, and just doing whatever I wanted to do and making decisions that weren't right. Mm -hmm. And so went to school that next week, um, about to be the weekend, Thursday rolls around. I go to my first couple classes. I had a weird feeling that day because of a text message I had gotten, um, but it wasn't anything like super important or that gave anything away. Um, my assistant principal comes and gets me out of fourth period and I get pulled into a conference room with my mother, our assistant principal and our principal. And the assistant principal um, asked me if I was at a certain location this past weekend um, with a certain person. And I answered yes to both questions. And then he proceeded to tell me that that person had now put a report into the school counselor that the actions that we partaked in were unconsensual. And so at that point, I kind of just like sunk. Everything in my world kind of just kind of gave out completely. Um, and at that point, my mother didn't even know um, that I had been doing anything of that sort. So, I mean, as heavy as it is, I kind of try to bring a little bit of light with it because I tell everybody, like, my assistant principal was the one who told my mom that I lost my virginity. And so, like, I never got that conversation with my mother. She got blindsided by it. Mm -hmm. I took that away from her. I took that away from myself. Um, but letting her know that in that way was one of the most embarrassing things that's wow. ever happened. And uh, so they kept me out of school for a couple of days. Um, thought there was going to be charges pressed. Thought something was going to happen because, I mean, I watch TV. Um, mm -hmm. Things just start to turn. Certain things look certain ways to some people. You find one piece of something here. You find another piece of something there. And you got a story. Yeah. And my biggest fear was probably getting out to the public with nobody really knowing what happened. Mm -hmm. um, but luckily, they kept it on the down low as much as possible. Of course, the immediate people who knew about it kind of told their friends. Um, but I went to school with six, for six weeks. Um, and I know that because I counted. Um, I didn't know what day I was going to show up and there was going to be a couple of police officers waiting on me at the front door telling me that I was under arrest and I had the right to remain silent and anything I could do or anything I say will be used against me in the court of law. Like I've, I mean, I looked at everything, read through everything mm. and I was waiting, if I'm honest. I was like, you know what? Like, I know what happened. God knows what happened. And if nobody else believes it, like, it's my truth. Like, I know it. And I know what happened. And I just kept saying that over and over again. I know what happened. Like, this is not about to happen. But if it did, I was okay enough and confident enough in myself that I would be able to fight through it, that I would be able to prove my innocence in whatever happened. And so I was ready to fight. I don't give up. I was ready to fight for what I knew happened and what the truth was. Um, so I went to school for six weeks, like I said. And then we got a call one day when I went home. Um, from the police office and they asked us to come down and give a statement came down and took my side of the story and then she handed me an envelope that basically detailed the entire thing just how I'd explained it and said that she was lying the entire time mm -hmm. and for a lot of people you'd be like yeah that'd be like a, a really really great moment but it was just kind of like relief because I knew like okay I wasn't going to go to jail but I'm going to school tomorrow mm -hmm. Like, I don't really care. I mean, I do. I care what they think because they're police officers. They need to know sure. the truth. But they're not the people I'm spending eight hours a day with. Yeah. That are seeing me, that I play sports with, or wow. that I played sports with. And I had to live with that for a very long time. It affects how I, I carry myself today. Um, it affected how I carried myself then. I was always looking over my shoulder. Wow. Because um, I thought there was going to be one day to where somebody that didn't like me, that heard a twisted side of the story, and they decided to take it upon themselves. And I mean, 
I'm not a punk. I mean, I'm a small guy, but you but bring you can two scrap, or three. Though. Yeah. You put two or three. I, I can scrap with one. If you put two or three, which is always my fear because. Um, <laughs> I mean, you may have to take off yeah, your primetime yeah, jersey. I, yeah, you but can't you can... rip this. <laughs> but I was living with that every single day. And it yeah. was something that it sucked. It was something that I had to just fight through. Um, but it wasn't a really like a long lasting feeling of relief. Um, like I said, it was immediate that they believed it, but then it kind of went into the mental state of, yeah. okay, what's everybody else think now? Because besides my immediate friends, my six or seven in my family, I didn't want to tell anybody else that this even got brought up. Yeah. But yeah, like yeah. I was hearing it. I knew other people knew. I like, I could just tell like people, some people for a, a long time looked at me a lot differently because they didn't know the truth and living with that was tough, but I got through it as best as I could. Um, like I've said in every other story that I've told, my parents were there for me again, um, like they always are. And mm -hmm. They're the biggest example for me of what God's love feels like. Um, I've got, and it's, I mean, it's maybe comical, but I've got the, the brute and the, the tough love from my dad, and I've got the sweet and kind heart of my mom, and they kind of just come together, and they do a very, very wonderful job of parenting and set mm -hmm. a great example for not just me but i think everybody they come in contact mm -hmm. with so like i've said i wouldn't be anywhere without them yeah and they brought me through that just like they have time and time again that's good that's good so that weight of what everybody else is thinking oh it's heavy yeah and I'm, hiding i'm just turned 18 senior in high school like my identity which was basketball i don't do that anymore basketball season's like coming to an end i'm about to graduate so I'm feeling like good before this happens. And then it just, and so now you're walking around with that hiding, like, and then projecting off of what other people are thinking. You know, you don't know what they're thinking, but you've got a projection of what they're thinking and you're reading their face and you're wondering what their body language, yeah. like the whole, you know, mind game. Like what, what does that do to you? I mean, you're constantly just pushing, pushing this down. I and mean, what does yeah. that do to you? I mean, it's kind of, it was funny when you were talking about it when I brought up basketball, but like when I say that was like my identity, like that was my identity. Like I know we're told when we're younger, like you're not supposed to have idols other than God. And like that's something that always really stuck with me because for a long time, basketball was more important than God mm -hmm. for me. If we had a game at sun, on Sunday at 930, I wasn't, I wasn't yeah. here. We were at the basketball game. Yeah. It wasn't, hey, we, we go to church on Sundays. No, we were at the basketball game. Yeah. We had a championship to win that weekend. And so mm. when that's just kind of like stripped away from you, yeah, and then it's counteracted with something that kind of just gives you a whole new identity to some people, it's like, okay, he went from this, or in my head I'm thinking they're, that they're looking at me like, okay, he played basketball, he quit, starts hanging out with these people, well, blah, 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 and they start to put it together, and the next thing I know, I'm walking around, like I said, looking over my shoulder every single day. And so while I was playing basketball, I was very confident in like myself because I knew with my craft I was very, very good. So I had something to be confident in yeah. within myself, and so it gave me a self-confidence. Yeah. And Became without that, mm -hmm. without that, it kind of, I took a hit. But then right after this happened, that's when my self-confidence was gone. I mean, absolutely gone. I was just so down on myself. I degraded myself every day. I was just like, you're not worth it. You're, you're too dirty. You're too this, you're too that. And just hating on myself every single day. And it just put me in a place to where I knew that, myself and my flesh I couldn't pull myself out of it and that's when I started reaching and that's when I, I say it every time and I just said it like I honestly feel like God uses my mother especially as that physical representation because every time like literally she knows it's the weirdest thing ever I know mama said they have that mother's <laughs> intuition but like it, it's weird like mm -hmm. every even if it's just like a minor minor thing that just upsets me she knows mm -hmm. every time. And it's like just that reminder that I always have a hand. I always have somebody that loves me. I always have support. And that's the same thing I think about God. That yeah. No matter where I turn, no matter how sad I am, no matter how, how many times I turn away, he's just right there. 
Yeah. He's got his arms open. He's waiting for you. And, yeah, that's good. And you don't, and I had to learn this through my father with the things that he um, ended up doing in his own walk, but you don't have to like earn anything. Like I've always thought, because I've always had that sports mentality, you got to be first. You got to be the best. You got to do this. You can be your worst and come to God because mm-hmm. he's going to make you into your best. Mm. I promise. Mm. I promise. Because I learned it. I, I, I had to strip everything I had in the life that I had built in Kennesaw. I had a girlfriend. I had I was living in a house with my buddies. I was working. But it wasn't where I needed to be. And that was when I was at my worst. I was doing things that I shouldn't have been doing, like I said, making the wrong decisions. And I had to run back home. Mm-hmm. Literally. I had to run back home. And it fixed everything. Yeah. So when we when we have this temptation to push everything down to hide to hide from god to hide from people Mm -hmm. to hide especially from the people we love what i'm hearing you share is the most important thing we can do is bring these things to light to cast it's it's the verse you shared with me before we came in here Mm -hmm. first peter 5 7 Mm -hmm. to cast your anxieties on him because he cares for you, mm-hmm. you know. To cast is to throw, to elevate, to bring to the light so that the light can consume those things that have been in the darkness for so long. Yeah. It's direct opposition of what the devil's plan is mm-hmm. for us. And I think about that in terms of this question, how do I experience God in the midst of depression? First thing is don't isolate yourself, mm-hmm. right? To bring, don't hide bring things to light and that doesn't mean to broadcast your story for no. everybody you got to have those people that for you you know yeah everybody that, has those people yeah and you know who i'm talking about if you're listening like you've you've got somebody yeah there's at least one that when you have a bad day that's the person you want to pick up the phone and call it's like, good if it, if that that's all it takes if you say if you get it out in some way to somebody that genuinely cares about you You'll just, it, it won't make everything go away, but it's just a daily routine of trying to make yourself better. Yeah, yeah that's Getting good. in the good habits of things that bring you happiness and surrounding yourself with people like, that are that are not only good influences, but have a good heart. Yeah. That they understand what you're going through and they're going to be patient with you and they're going to be there for the entire time and not just leave you hanging. Yeah, God uses his people. Mm-hmm. That's good. Bring it to the light. Cast your anxieties on him. And a lot of times that means bringing it to the people that are closest to you that he's put in your life for a purpose, mm-hmm. right? Bring it to the light and let the light consume uh, what's been in the dark. That's how we experience God in the midst of depression. It's not going to end in a moment. Nope. It's a journey. It's a mm-hmm. process just like anything in life. But you'll get through it yeah. if you continue to seek the light. And uh Man, what a story. Thanks so much for being here and for being on the show. Yes, sir. For gracing us with uh, Flashback Fashion <laughs> Friday, uh, you know, on Burning Questions. So yeah, I did my best. Yes, sir. Appreciate you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Burning Questions. If you have a burning question that you've been longing for an answer to, DM us on our Instagram at cmcstudents underscore.